our relationship with the mobile phone. We look at ours an average of 150 times per day. Over the course of 20 years, they have become more than a companion. They are virtually our new religion. Across the globe, 57 mobile phones are sold every second, which works out at 1.8 billion per year. Today, there are more mobile phones than toothbrushes in the world. Yes, yes, you did hear that right. And the big winners in this revolution are the mobile phone multinationals. It's party time at Apple. Nokia, Samsung, LG, Sony, Hawaii, and HTC. But faced with these corporate giants, we asked ourselves a very simple question. Behind the scenes, how are our phones manufactured and under what conditions? We spent one year trying to answer this question. We traveled around the world to find out exactly what is at the other end of the line. And frankly, what we discovered made our blood run cold. In China, we went to work in one of the factories that manufacture our phones. Behind these masks, we found dozens of children. Quand vous voyez euh, les visages de ces enfants, qu'est-ce que ça produit chez vous C'est honteux euh, que quelque part, euh, par notre ignorance, on a pu laisser faire ça. We also trace back to the raw materials that our phones are made from. In Africa, men die to supply our mobile phones with minerals. In this mine, when a five people die every month on average, does meet your personal values. So, now, put your phone on silent while we reveal the secrets of how it is made. To find the answers to our questions on how our phones are manufactured, we look to China whose factories supply the entire world. The majority of phones that are sold across the globe are manufactured here. We were able to access over 20 reports from a company that analyzes all of the phone's components, including parts, software, and materials. And more importantly, the difference between the cost of manufacturing a mobile phone and its sale price in the stores. Take, for example, the Galaxy S4. Not including marketing costs, Samsung achieves a profit margin of 307 euros. And for Apple's iPhone 5S, that margin is even higher, at 340 euros. Our attention is drawn to another line as well, one that hardly ever changes, labor costs. On average, these brands only spend 2.38 euros on labor costs per phone. In other words, the Chinese workers only earn enough to buy a couple of loaves of bread to make devices that we will spend up to 900 euros on. Maybe you think you paid a lot for your mobile phone, but it might be that the workers who made it paid a higher price. For several weeks, we have been asking the big mobile phone brands to provide us with their supplier lists. We wanted to meet this low-cost labor force and find out more about their working conditions. Not one brand has come back to us. So we've had to take things into our own hands. We stumbled across a recruitment leaflet for a subcontractor who supplies screens to big smartphone brands. The factory is called LCE, and the working conditions that it promises are idyllic. Air-conditioned apartments with volleyball courts and snooker tables, all provided as part of the package. And above all, a salary of 3,500 yen, which equates to 430 euros, well above the average salary in China. It is located in Nanchang, in central China. The agricultural city of Nanchang, with a population of 5 million, has become the new labor reservoir for the high-tech companies. In the center of the New Technologies District, we find LCE's factory, the Happy Factory. 
Despite our numerous requests, those in charge of the factory have refused to see us. And so we've had to put Plan B into action and have got a job at the factory. In one of the city's hotels, we have a meeting with Jiang, who has been hired by LCE. Jiang has already infiltrated nearly a dozen factories that manufacture smartphones. He works for the NGO China Labor Watch, an association known throughout the world for its investigations into working conditions in China. After two weeks working in LCE's factory, he has just quit his job. He wishes to remain anonymous. Such images are extremely rare. It is virtually impossible to film inside the telephone factories in China. As soon as you enter the building, you understand that there is no joking about here. The bosses pin apology notes from employees onto the walls. For example, from this worker who damaged some equipment. What a warm atmosphere. We see our first images from the factory floors and also get our first surprise. In this happy factory, each worker wears a number on their back, an ID number. C'est courant d'avoir un, un numéro quand on est ouvrier dans une usine de téléphone portable. Euh, Jiang worked in the screen quality control department. His job was to make sure that there wasn't a single scratch on the smartphone screens. The supervisors imposed an unsustainable work pace. At the end of his long working day, Jiang hoped to go back to his large apartment as described in the factory's brochure. But instead, this is what he found a 20 meter squared dormitory that packs in eight workers all year round. But we find something even more disturbing than hazardous working conditions in this factory. Jiang discovered that it is not only adults behind those ID numbers. Uh, Children making mobile phones, something that is not only completely against international law, but also against the law in China, which prohibits children under the age of 16 from working. According to Jiang, this means that the LCE factory employs more than 100 children under the age of 16. Bonjour. We're going to check it out. Bonjour. Bonjour. Je voudrais voir un responsable de l'usine, s'il vous plaît. That would be this gentleman in the checked shirt. We film discreetly. Bonjour. Hello. Yeah. 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 Martin. Est-ce que vous faites travailler les enfants de moins de 16 ans? Are you convinced? 
we weren't. But as the manager has forbidden us to stay in front of the factory, we hire a car with tinted windows and park just opposite the entrance. We film with a lens that allows us to zoom in on the workers' faces as they go in and come out of the building. It's a little paparazzi in style, but we don't have any choice. In the early hours of the morning, at the end of the night shift, the workers leave through the factory's main door to go back to the dormitories across the road. After a few minutes, the facts are clear. The factory gates seem more like school gates, with groups of adolescents arm in arm. One of them has even come out with a teddy bear in hand. When you take a closer look, you see the faces of adolescents, and of children even. In their dozens. We go to ask them how old they are, discreetly so as not to alert the factory managers. We come across a group of much older workers who are well aware of the situation. Amongst the children who are coming out of the factory, this young girl, whose name is Jia Jia. She agrees to tell us more about her working conditions because she has decided to leave the factory soon. We meet her in a nearby restaurant. You have what age? Ça fait combien de temps que vous travaillez en face Vous devez en faire combien des écrans Est-ce que vous travaillez de nuit parfois Jia Jia only earns 160 euros per month on average for this hard labor. Children working at night for up to 13 hours at a time with just two days off each month. What they're doing in this factory is illegal. And which mobile phones are manufactured under these conditions? You will have heard of them, no doubt, seeing as they're sold all over Europe. This is what we've retrieved from the factory's production line, a smartphone from Huawei, the third largest mobile phone vendor in the world. The screen is typical of the brand's latest range, such as the Y600 or the G510. We check with Jia Jia by showing her this G510 model from Huawei. We tried everything we could to meet with the people in charge at Huawei. We sent emails and made telephone calls, but it was impossible to get an interview. 
We tried again and again, but none of Huawei's managers wants to meet us. Here at Huawei, the question we ask most is not why, but why not? Well, we just want to know why. Huawei gives us this answer. Concerning our suppliers, they must follow a charter that formally prohibits the employment of children. If there is any breach by the supplier, we will take all necessary actions to stop such breach. Huawei doesn't seem to be particularly interested. In its response, it doesn't even ask us for the name of the factory, something which would be useful for them to be able to take action. But to be fair, Huawei isn't the only brand that works with LCE, the factory with child workers. Whilst we were undercover, we got hold of this order sheet from the company. During the months of March and April 2014 alone, more than 600,000 screens were produced. The majority of them have been manufactured for the big-name brands that are sold in Europe. One of its biggest clients is Tino, with 76,400 screens ordered in just two months. As it is a Chinese brand, the name Tino might not mean anything to you. That is because these phones are sold under a much more well-known Rico, première, à Marseille. On a découvert euh, que cette usine faisait travailler des enfants, et notamment des enfants de 13 ans. On va regarder ensemble hein, les visages de certains de ces enfants. Il y a Gia Gia, par exemple, qu'on a filmé. On la regarde ensemble, elle a 13 ans. Il n'y a pas de doute possible. Quand on voit son visage, on ne peut pas se dire non, elle a 18 ans ou 17 ans. Euh, on voit bien que c'est une très, très, très jeune adolescente. Je Quand vous voyez euh, les visages de ces enfants, euh, Qu'est-ce que ça produit chez vous J'ai une profonde émotion, ça m'émeut de voir ça. C'est honteux que quelque part, par notre ignorance, on ait pu laisser faire ça. C'est dramatique. J'ai appris ça quand j'ai été contacté par vos équipes. Euh, ça m'a profondément affecté. Ça m'a profondément secoué aussi parce que j'ai vu des reportages sur nos principaux concurrents qui, effectivement, euh, travaillent aussi avec la Chine. Et je pensais que, peut-être un peu naïvement, que nous, Ico, nous étions un peu à l'abri de ça. Mm. Et euh, à partir du 10 juin, le groupe a décidé de, de stopper toute relation commerciale avec cette usine-là. Donc à partir du 10 juin, le, le groupe avait arrêté de travailler avec cette usine LCE. Comment on a pu en arriver là Est-ce que les autorités ferment les yeux Est-ce que ça arrange tout le monde au final J'ai du mal à répondre à cette question. C'est peut-être la course effrénée des fois du profit, de l'inconscience, de l'insouciance, de vieilles pratiques locales. Nous avons décidé d'intensifier ces contrôles. Je lui ai demandé euh, d'augmenter la fréquence des visites et surtout des visites surprises. Je ne peux pas vous dire que, que je ne serai pas confronté à ce genre de problème à l'avenir. Ce que je peux vous garantir et ce sur quoi je m'engage, c'est de tout mettre en œuvre pour que ça ne se reproduise plus. And for our part, we guarantee that we will keep a very close eye on the situation. It has to be recognized that Wico's bosses have not shrugged off their responsibility whereas another brand, when faced with their responsibilities, went into hiding. Alcatel One Touch, the other big manufacturer that is supplied by LCE, the factory with child workers. Alcatel One Touch, the fifth largest mobile phone vendor in the world. Despite our numerous requests to Alcatel One Touch, we did not receive a single email, letter or phone call, nothing. It seems that as soon as we show up, everyone goes into hiding. Take a guess at how many phones have been sold across the world since you've been watching this investigation. 123,000. To fulfill such high demand, it's clear that a large number of workers are required, but also a large number of raw materials. Let's take a closer look at a smartphone. Have you already asked yourself, what exactly is in my smartphone? Well, there are more than 300 parts, with the majority made from minerals. Your screen, made with aluminium from Australia. The welds of your circuit board, made with zinc from Malaysia. The wires of your chip, 
made with copper from Chile, your battery with lithium from Bolivia. Out of all the elements that make up a smartphone, we are most interested in this small component, tantalum capacitors. It stops energy and resists heat very well. When the battery on your phone dies and it switches off, it's thanks to the tantalum that you don't lose all of the data that you have in it. With three capacitors per smartphone, the mobile phone industry is one of the biggest consumers of tantalum. 80% of the world's reserves of this mineral are found in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. After a 6,000 kilometer journey, we arrive in Rubaya in North Kivu. It's from here that most of the mobile phone brands extract the essential tantalum. <laughs> However, we have barely even stepped off the plane before we start to understand exactly what it means to live in the world's second poorest country. In Rubaya, there are no roads, no networks, no electricity, no drinking water and very little food. A river runs through its center but there isn't even a bridge to get across it. However, the city backs on to a gold mine, or rather a tantalum mine, that sits high up there. To find out more, we must climb this mountain, past the endless procession of those carrying the sacks of minerals. <laughs> We have government authorization to visit this mine, but on site, those in charge are not having any of it. After one hour of negotiation, we are finally authorized to film here. This is the Tantalum mine. Miners squeeze themselves through these holes, with 3,000 people working here day and night. Last year, 360 tons of tantalum raw materials came out of these pits. Here they call the raw tantalum Colton. A 40 kilo sack like this one sells for 600 euros to the brokers when it comes out of the mine but fetches up to 3,500 euros on the international market. A wealth that should benefit the miners and at least guarantee that they have decent working conditions. But that is not the case. How long have you been working here? Um, three months. Three months? Yeah, it's maybe enough for me. Is it dangerous? It's dangerous. To find out more about this danger, we need to go down into the depths of the pits. The mine is very narrow. And the further we go down, the less oxygen there is. The temperature is 43 degrees. <sighs> 30 meters further down, at the end of the tunnel, we find the Colton diggers. <sighs> Some rudimentary wooden planks hold up the gallery. Twelve hours per day, with a total daily wage of five euros fifty. Ça c'est un bon morceau. Le coltan il est jaune, c'est ça? Le coltan. Le jaune c'est un coltan. And while we are filming. The gallery's ceiling begins to collapse. 
Montez vite. Montez, montez. Hier, Kadandi, on peut rentrer. Rock slides are what all the miners are worried about. The mine's managers follow us everywhere, and so it is impossible to get more information on the accidents. It's below in the valley that we will make a discovery. At the local hospital that was built by an NGO. Where there are 60 beds and just one operating table. Giulio Carvisperi has been running the emergency room here on a daily basis for the past two years with what he has available to him. This 63-year-old Italian is the type of person who restores your faith in humanity. Amongst the patients that day, this Colton miner who is only just recovering from an accident. <laughs> Injured miners make up the majority of patients in the hospital, with an average of 50 cases per month. And seeing this procession of victims, Dr. Giulio, as he's called here, always asks himself the same question. Quel est qui vous pousse à entrer là-bas en, ch en cherchant les dangers qui est là? C'est le coup de temps, je suis au conseil. Ah, mon ami, je suis marié au cac. Je te crois qu'à Matano, ma ligne va couper, mais je ne cache pas ni tocha. Quand elle se crée l'accident, à Catoroc. Ça, c'est les antipiques. Lui, il est sorti, mais quatre sont restés là-bas. Combien de fois se sont passées cette histoire là-bas? Nous, on ne connaît pas. Personne ici va le dire. Officiellement, on n'a rien. Ce sont, comme vous venez de dire, sont les morts fantômes. The Phantom Dead. Dr. Julio certainly sees hundreds of injured miners come through these doors, but he never sees any bodies. Why is that? This evening, in the village, with no one watching, we meet with a miner who has just retired. Norbert Buira. He left the mine because he was scared to be there. Quand il y a éboulement, on laisse la partie déjà éboulée et on dévie. On... Donc les corps, on les laisse à côté. On laisse des, les, les corps à côté et on, on continue avec la recherche. Donc ceux qui meurent dans les, dans les trous là-bas, et c'est tout, et, et, et c'est déjà leur tombeau. C'est ça normalement dans la carrière. Vous pouvez entrer à 8h et à 8h05 minutes, déjà vous êtes mort. Vous êtes. Donc vous êtes candidat de la mort là-bas. We're talking about dozens of deaths. The Tantalum miners pay with their lives so that our smartphones can work. Even if the Democratic Republic of the Congo officially prohibits those under 15 years old from working in the mines, the reality is very different. When the boss of the mine in Rubaya learns that we're in the area, he sends this worrying message to his teams. So that is why, every time we approach, the children run away from us. Sometimes it's even a game of cat and mouse, for example here. Look harder, can you see him? Just there. One of our contacts on the ground has been able to take this photo from just before we arrived. 
He is the Congolese version of mining school. Children that risk their lives and miners buried alive in a village that is cut off from the world. It is under these conditions that the tantalum we have inside our phones is extracted. But who is it exactly that profits from such a situation? We'll have to follow the trail of the sacks of tantalum, all the way to those who sell it at international level. Most of the mines in Rubaya belong to just one company, MHI. But we wanted to find out which companies buy tantalum from MHI. At least one company confirms it does so, the American firm AVX. In this press release from March 2014, AVX indicates that an MHI mine supplies it with tantalum. Our supply chain includes the MHI mine which supplies us with tantalum. AVX is specialised in capacitors, which, if you recall, are these little tantalum components that prevent our mobile phones from losing data when the battery runs out. In this wonderful internal PowerPoint of AVX, we discover who are its largest purchasers of compositors. We find RIM, the parent company of BlackBerry, as well as Motorola and Nokia. According to our sources, since we filmed there, at least eight men have been killed in the mines. Nokia had promised to give us an in-depth reply, but instead we received this email from Nokia's global management. We take these kind of allegations very seriously. While we do not directly source minerals such as tantalum, Microsoft is committed to responsible sourcing practices across our supply chain. We have an official policy on responsible sourcing in our products. We will continue to promote the fair treatment, safety and well-being of workers and sustainable sourcing in our supply chain. Nokia did not ask us for any specific details, such as the names of the victims or the exact locations of the rock slides in Rubaya. We decide to speak to Bill Gates. Because Nokia now belongs to Microsoft, the multinational founded by the billionaire. The richest man in the world is no longer running the show, but he still has a seat on the board of directors and still owns 330 million shares in the company. The businessman has turned philanthropist. Through his foundation, he aids the poorest nations, in Africa in particular. Therefore, surely he would be concerned about the situation of the miners in Rubaya, who die making Microsoft slash Nokia phones. What would he say if we asked him about this during one of his foundation's press conferences at Soliday's festival? We have been investigating uh, this last nine months on the Nokia supply chain, which now belongs to Microsoft. Some of these minerals come from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. In this mine, we witnessed uh, child labor, uh, five people die every month on average. So here's my question, Mr. Gates. Uh, does what I just described to you uh, meet your personal values or Microsoft values? And also, how come a, a, a company like yours uh, okay. cannot prevent this kind uh, of uh, situation? Okay, I'm sorry, but nous sommes ici pour parler de la fondation et pas de Microsoft. Okay, I'm sorry, it's just serious matters. I'm sorry to, to, to insist. If you could uh, answer, that'd be great for French National TV. Yeah, I mean, I. I... I'm not working at Microsoft as an employee anymore, so I, I'm sorry. I... Exactly. Well, you're still a board so, member, no, aren't okay. you? Okay, c'est une con... C'est une con... Je suis désolée, c'est une conférence de presse sur la fondation de Monsieur Gates. Et sur ce sujet, c'est une question. Une question Oui. Question. This way, please, this way, this way. So are you beginning to understand how these big smartphone multinationals work? 
Their businesses are so prosperous that they can easily turn their back on difficult questions. During this investigation, another big name brand has continually turned its back on us, although it flaunts itself across the globe. Samsung, the biggest phone vendor in the world, with 300 million smartphones sold last year. It is also the brand that is the most criticized by the NGOs, because despite numerous controversies, the multinational has not changed its ways. Recently, China Labor Watch published seven reports denouncing the deplorable working conditions at the subcontracts of Samsung. And every time, Samsung has announced audits, all of which found nothing. For China Labor Watch's director, the reason for this is simple. The subcontractors are given advance warnings of the inspections. So,我在公司都可以去做,但是问题他们不做,他们,那他们不愿意去做这个问题,实际上我相信他们做比我们更专业,可能更好,更有更多的这个,呃,不管是人力还有资源方面,都比我们更充分的。他如果说了解到这个
l'autre jour, je voulais vous parler. Non. Élise Lucien, parce que j'ai regardé tout le show, là, c'était plus intéressant. Merci. Je voulais, je voulais vous remettre ces documents, là. Non, merci. C'est une China Merci. Pas d'interdiction. Non, non, mais c'est la manière dont ils sont fabriqués vos téléphones merci. avec du travail d'enfant. Désolé. Avec des gens qui travaillent 18 heures par jour. Avec des gens qui n'ont que 3 dollars de, de on salaire. Va, on va laisser, je vous entends pas bien, on va laisser terminer le show. Si oui, vous mais parce qu'en fait, c'est très difficile d'avoir accès à vous, donc je vais vraiment vous poser des questions. On a un service de presse qui Je sais, on, les, on les a sollicités, mais c'est très difficile. Et comme vous parlez français, je, je voulais vous poser des que, questions. Je suis sûr qu'il reviendra. Ça vous pose problème, j'imagine, que des téléphones ça me soient désolé, fabriqués par des enfants. Pas, pas ça vous pose soit, un problème, j'imagine. Non, mais On n'a pas on n'a pas prévu d'interview. Il y a des téléphones ce soir. Florence 864 pages, il y a des rapports, il y a des plaintes aussi. Qui sont vus, bien sûr. Bien sûr, oui, oui, mais c'est vous qui m'intéressez. Là, il met les gens Je suis ravi, mais. Il y a 864 pages de rapports, des plaintes qui sont déposées en Chine, qui sont déposées au Brésil. Et vous n'attendez pas à ce genre de questions, en fait. Merci. Jamais. Ni aujourd'hui, ni demain, ni jamais. Merci, madame. Merci. Merci, en tout cas. Merci. Following this interview, Samsung sent us this pleasant six-page long letter, which said, Samsung Electronics strives to offer a working environment that meets the highest standards in the industry. Out of more than 90,000 workers, not a single worker under the legal age has been identified. Despite this clean score sheet, Samsung still announces 15 or so new measures in order to combat child labor, such as... Samsung suppliers must ensure that the ID photo matches the employee. They must use face recognition software, and in any case of doubt, they need to consult with the relevant authorities. We're in the same position as you. Looking at our mobiles, we never imagined that they would contain so many secrets. And it's not over yet. One of the parts in our cherished mobiles is also one of the biggest causes of pollution in the world. It's the domino effect. At the end of the chain, an entire town is sacrificed to manufacture our phones. It is this photo from an Australian journalist that sent us in the right direction. To find out more, let's open our phone's cover one last time. Amongst the essential parts that make our smartphones work, magnets. They are in the vibrate facility, in the microphone, in the speakerphone, and even in the camera. A dozen in total in every mobile phone. These magnets are made with neodymium, the most magnetic chemical element in the world. The largest neodymium mine can be found in the region of Baoto, in northern China, at the border with Mongolia. Our mobile phone's magnets are born here, in these neodymium mountains, which accounts for 97% of the world's production. But this El Dorado has a price. And that price is pollution. Acid baths, heavy metals, caustic soda. For each ton of neodymium produced, one ton of waste and 75,000 liters of acid water are discharged. And the factory spits out everything here, into this huge lake waste dump. 600,000 tons of waste are poured out every year. The lake stretches over 11 square kilometers, an area equivalent to Saint-Tropez, but with less sun and more radioactivity. According to this internal document from the International Atomic Energy Agency, the area is highly radioactive, thanks to the chemical waste. The company responsible for this pollution is Bao Gang the owner of the neodymite factories. Those in charge of the company refuse all our interview requests. We enter this red area, the contaminated zone. At first sight, the village seems to be abandoned, but there are figures who wander through these empty pathways, such as this lady. 
Yu Julian, who is 60 years old. Et les gens sont partis à cause de la pollution aussi To help us better understand the situation, Yu Julian is going to take us to meet one of her last remaining neighbors. Zhu Tzu Ying would love to leave, but she can't afford to. While she waits, she has no choice but to drink the tap water. One of the villagers points out a well to us, where we can gain access to the water table. The problem is that the well is 300 meters away from the waste dump lake of the Bao Gang. There is a camera on every post. In total, nearly 100 survey the area. There is even a watchtower. We need to go quickly. This zone is out of bounds. A flask attached to a ball of wool. It's a little bit MacGyver in fashion, but it's all that we could find at the time. After a few minutes, we bring up some of the well's water. For now, there are no arrests. We send the water to our team in Paris, who send it to an independent French laboratory for analysis. A few days later, the results are beyond any doubt. This is no longer drinking water, but a deadly cocktail. Si on regarde les, les, les métaux lourds, on a euh, beaucoup d'arsenic, beaucoup trop d'arsenic. Euh, on, on, on a beaucoup de lithium, on a beaucoup de, de manganèse, on a une énorme quantité de strontium. Euh, les chlorures, le sodium, euh, c'est 5-6 fois au-dessus de la norme. Euh, L'uranium est au-dessus également. Euh, les sulfates sont à près de 3000 mg par litre, donc 10 fois plus élevé que la réglementation européenne. C'est une eau qui n'est pas consommable, c'est clair, euh, ni pour la boisson, ni pour la cuisine, ni pour euh, l'irrigation. Et quelles sont les conséquences sur la santé quand on boit cette eau tous les jours Des problèmes de, de, qui peuvent aller jusqu'à des problèmes de cancer, des cancers de la peau, et puis on pourrait trouver aussi à, à terme des cancers de l'intestin ou, de ou de la vessie. In Baotou's hospital, we're going to find out more about the victims of this polluted water. No doctor is authorized to speak to us. And we film with a hidden camera. A team of carers agree to meet us under condition of anonymity. They call Baotou the cancer city. They want to show us their cancer ward. For them, there is no doubt the pollution from Baogang's factories is slowly killing the city of Baotou. 
There isn't a single epidemiological study that has been carried out, but the doctors themselves have talked of several hundreds of victims. But hear that? No, it's complete radio silence. The authorities don't want the story to get out. Their business with the smartphone brands could suffer as a result. As we leave the hospital, we are stopped by security. I'm sorry. We film discreetly. If we want to be able to leave, we have to sign this letter, in which we agree not to carry out any report on Bao Gang or on its waste dump lake. If any report is published, we will face okay. responsibilities for it. Yeah. To make sure that nothing can be broadcast, the police also confiscate our photos. But to tell the truth, we'd anticipated this. We had enough time to hide the memory card containing the real images and swap it with another card, prepared especially for the occasion. This was what the Chinese policemen have seized. We would have liked to have seen their faces when they discovered the images, but we don't have time. We really need to get out of the city. A large proportion of the mobile phone industry works with Bao Gang, the company responsible for the pollution. Amongst them is Sony, one of whose magnet providers are supplied by Bao Gang, or LG. The South Korean brand has all but signed a partnership deal with Bao Gang. Are these two smartphone giants aware of the pollution problems? And what are they doing to resolve it? Both brands refuse to grant us an interview. But as a strange coincidence, in their email response, they both use the same formula. Even if Bao Gang is not a direct supplier of ours, it's possible that this company's neodymite is present in our devices. We take your allegations very seriously and will carry out an internal investigation to find out more. Despite our reminders, we haven't been able to see any results from these investigations. When the mobile phone companies don't reply, we turn to their representative. Digital Europe, the European lobby for mobile phone manufacturers. Amongst its members are Sony and LG, of course, but also Apple, Blackberry, Huawei and Nokia. Under communication's watchful eye, the director receives us in his office. This company is a supplier of the mobile phone industry. When you see that, what do you think? I mean, clearly what you're telling me here is uh, news, to, news to me. Um, as I say, I'm glad you're passing that on to me. And I think that uh, the, the industry will want to see China improve its regulatory environment in order that these people uh, don't continue to suffer from, the, from, from such pollution. The, don't you think your members also have a responsibility in this situation? I think our members do have a responsibility in this situation to ensure that their supply chain uh, follows the laws and regulations. Yes, I do. I'm a little astonished that none of the companies uh, have been willing to answer us. How would you explain that? We have the, uh, the proof that they do work with Baogong. So we know that they know what's going on there and nobody wants mm. to answer us. Well, I hope you'll, I hope you'll take, um, so I hope you'll take something you from the fact that uh, I'm prepared to engage uh, to some extent on behalf of the industry on that issue. OK, you, you wouldn't drink this water, would you? Well, <laughs> I wouldn't drink that water, no. Yeah, well, they do drink this water mm. for 20 years. Mm. Since this interview, not a single brand has ceased working with Bao Gang, the company responsible right. for the pollution. All right. And as we finish off our investigation, we know what you are going to ask. So what do we do now? How do we force the mobile phone industry to make changes? We don't have the answer, but what we do have is hope. Do you recall the scandal of working conditions in the trainer factories of the 1990s? 
children on production lines, pollution, irresponsible multinationals. Does it ring a bell? Faced with consumer mobilization, the main trainer brands had to make big changes and reassess their supply chain. And today, their codes of conduct are amongst the strictest in the world. Of course, it's not perfect, but already it's a lot better. In the smartphone sector, new initiatives have already appeared, such as Fairphone, a Dutch company that offers fair trade phones at the market price. Could this be the start of a growing movement that will demand better production conditions? The question tonight when we put down our smartphones must be, is part of the solution in our hands? <laughs>